All right. We are here with Ben Curtis of Honey Badger. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm good. I'm good. Right on. So uh, we'll just dive right into this. Can you give a kind of quick rundown of your career, your journey uh, that led you to Honey Badger? Sure. Well, you know, I've been interested in um, technology and development and entrepreneurism since uh, I was a kid. Um, I you know, started a business selling stuff like in middle school and started writing code when I was like eight or something. I don't know. Um, so, you know, going through college, uh, I had side projects, I had my own consulting business and, uh, I just, I just love business and tech. And so when I left college, the first thing I did was go work for a startup and, uh, I've been working for a number of startups ever since then, like, you know, I don't know, six or seven different places. And, uh, back in 2007, the startup I was working for, uh, folded and uh, everyone got laid off. And I figured, well, that's a good time as any to, to strike out on my own. So I started a freelancing then and uh, launched a product about six months later um, and then launched Rails Kits uh, a year after that. And um, yeah, and then worked another startup for a while and then started Honey Badger. So yeah, it's, it's been a whole lot of side projects and startups and just a lot of fun. So R Rails Kits is something that's interesting to me, not just because Sifter used it for the billing code, but uh, just in terms of how that uh, fit into what eventually kind of uh, your path that led you to Honey Badger. Uh, for those mm -hmm. that don't know, Rails Kits was basically batches of very focused code for specific purposes, and you could basically buy the libraries, kind of like a quick start kit. Uh, for certain things. Uh, like I said, I used uh, the billing one, heavily influenced uh, Sifter. And so you start out with a product and mm -hmm. we're selling that. Uh, and that wasn't your only thing, but kind of how did, from a business standpoint, how did that translate? Was there kind of dots that got connected or how did it unfold? Yeah. Well, you know, what, what really uh, was interesting about that is that Rails kits came along in uh, 2008 or so. I had been uh, in the Ruby and Rails community since about 2005, and that really uh, made a big difference in the success of that particular business. Being a part of the community, you know, I, I had built the plugin directory um, back when Rails first got plugins, and uh, before uh, you know, using gems was a thing for that. And so there's just a lot of awareness of who I was. I was blogging about Rails all the time, and the community was smaller then. So that really led to kind of an in, I guess, there. People, it was, I was a known quantity already. And so people were like, oh, okay, I can, I can probably trust this stuff. And then um, the thing that was interesting about that is, you know, Honey Badger also, we focused exclusively on the Rails and Ruby community when we first launched. And so, you know, a lot of those connections were still there. A lot of people already knew who I was and who, uh, and so there was already that trust. And so, yeah, that made a big difference in, you know, having paying customers from day one, for example. And you know, also knowing like what kind of uh, customer I wanted to have and, and who I was targeting with product. Yeah, so it's a, it a long history that built up and kind of set you up, uh, mm -hmm. at least for a little bit of a jump start. But ultimately, it's not like I'm I'm being a, a little presumptuous here, but something tells me that that uh, your reputation wasn't enough to launch the business to an immediate comfortable salary, full-time paying <laughs> gig. Is that the case? Oh, that would have been nice. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that wasn't the case. Well, in fact, when we first launched Honey Badger, uh, I really wasn't planning on it being a full-time thing. Uh, it was, it was a side project. Uh, and really I was, I was perfectly content with the idea of keeping my day job. I was a VP of engineering at a startup and running Honey Badger at the same time. I figured, Hey, you know, two income streams are better than one. Right. Um, but it just didn't work out that way. Um, Honey Badger was successful enough and required enough of my time that I really couldn't keep my day job. So unfortunately, it was one of the situations where I couldn't just like walk into the full salary with Honey Badger. Uh, there was a transition time. So I went back. I had been doing freelancing and consulting before the startup I was working at. So I went back to doing that for about a year, year and a half when there was that gap between leaving my full-time salary as a VP of engineering and then when Honey Badger could give me a full-time salary. Yeah, and so the, the reason I ask is so many people seem to uh, believe that a lot of people, you know, well, you were only successful because you already had a reputation or had something. And uh, I hear that story a lot uh, just 
amongst a lot of people, explaining away people's success. And the thing is, yes, it it generally does help you get a quicker jump start, but then it doesn't take you very far, right? It, it kind yeah. of, it's like yeah. a spark, but it's not going to carry you to enough to be a, a huge sustainable business. And I think a lot of people are almost fearful if they don't have that reputation um, and they don't have that to help them jumpstart because they think that it counts for more than it does. And to me, so much of it is you talk to the people who have had a reputation or um, had some exposure long before they launched and they launched, it was still a hard, grueling slog to grow the business to a point where it was actually a healthy, sustainable business. And so I have yet to find a point where that wasn't the case. So it's one of those things that it's, I feel like it's really good for people to remember and realize like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, it would be a bonus, but it's not going to make or break my business. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. It's, it's, it's definitely a foot in the door. It's definitely a good start. And I, I totally recommend it to anyone who asked me like, you know, how should I get started? Well, a good way to get started is to be involved in the community. But um, at the same time, like it's, you can do it without that. I have a friend who started a business selling to salons and, you know, that kind of, that kind of business. And he just went like literally door to door, like selling it and just bootstrapped it that way. Like he didn't mm -hmm. have any in the community. He wasn't like a hairstylist or anything, but um, that that's the target he wanted. And that's what he did. And just, he just worked it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and he's, he's doing well with that. So, yeah, I think it's, it's like you said, it's a great way to get a good start, but it's not critical and it's definitely not, you know, the end all be all. It's not going to get you, you know, Overnight success, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so how long have you been working on Honey Badger and what was the initial impetus that made you decide I've got to do this and it just, you couldn't brush it out of your mind anymore? Yeah. Well, we started, I guess, about five and a half years ago. So that's how long I've been running it. Um, Star and I were working for the same startup and, um, you know, we were we were building a Rails app, and at the time, like uh, the only exception, well, there were two, I think, exception monitoring services. One was Airbrake, and that's the one that we were using. And um, really, what made us start Honey Badger was Airbrake. We had we had a terrible customer experience with them one day, and uh, we just I just felt like uh, as a developer and as a human being, I deserve better service than I was getting from them. And um, so I just turned to Star and I'm like, you know what? We have to build our own and we have to do better than that. Um, and it turned out that a lot of people were having the same experience because as soon as we launched, people were like, yes, thank goodness, now there's an alternative. Um, this was back you know, before there was as much competition in this space as mm -hmm. there is today. Um, but that's what's really got it started. Like, it was, it was a frustration with, I have had a, I've had a bad experience with this product and I know I can build that same kind of product and I can deliver an awesome experience to go along with it. So that was, that was really our uh, impetus and, and still is our mission, like let's provide an awesome experience for a developer who's using our product. Um, you know, it's already a bad day when you're having a bunch of errors in your application. You don't need to have that compounded by having a crappy product when you're trying to deal with those errors, right? Or, or, or a crappy service that goes along with that product. And so we felt like, you know what, we deserve better and all developers deserve better and uh, we can deliver that better experience. Uh, so that's what we did. <clears throat> so you mentioned it, uh, that now that the market is much more competitive. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, you can look at that one of two ways. One is that means there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, two, it means I'm going to struggle to stand out. And on top of being competitive, it's a space with relatively low switching costs to move between providers. Uh, mm -hmm. So beyond loyalty, there's not a lot to keep somebody from jumping ship to the next one that comes along as soon as something else pops up. Uh, sure. Have you found that to be difficult? Are there tactics that y'all have uh, employed to help mitigate that? Or, you know, it, kind of how have y'all worked within that environment? Yeah, there definitely are challenges to that. Um, like you say, it's it's easy to switch from one to another, uh, and and there's really nothing that we can like we can't we can't hang on to any particular piece of data to kind of try and keep people in a system. So I think what our strategy has been, um, you mentioned loyalty, and you know people might say, oh, that's that's frou frou or whatever, but really, if you provide an awesome experience to people, both in the product you're delivering and in the service you're giving them, that that does create loyalty. I mean, we connect human to human, right? It's not just about, it's not just business, right? It's about people. 
And we believe strongly in that. And uh, yeah, we do have a lot of people who have been around basically as long as the product has been around. And and they stick because you know they like us, they like the product, and you know why why leave, right? A lot of people vote with their wallet, you know, and uh, they tell us, hey, I like you, and I'm happy to support you. Um, and as long as they don't uh, violate that trust or break that promise, I think we'll keep doing fine. Yeah, yeah, and that's. I think it's something that the answer is so simple. People don't want to believe it in that <laughs> if you take care of your customers and you provide good customer service, it will carry you a lot farther than you think. Now it's a lot mm -hmm. easier said than done. Providing great service takes a lot of effort and mm -hmm. at times takes an emotional toll and it can be exhausting. But the thing is because it's hard and exhausting, so many people don't bother to do it. And I feel like more and more companies are coming around and doing it now, but I still find plenty that just don't care. Uh, and it's, yeah. and it's obvious when a company cares and when they don't care. So, um, so how long did it take you to transition fully to honey badger in terms of, or, well, I guess you kind of had to transition instantly. It sounds like, uh, how <laughs> long, so how long did it take to transition over, uh, to where you're working on it full time, and then how much longer after that to where you felt like you were fairly compensated for a full time effort? Hmm. Well, um, I, we 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 spent about uh, three months, I guess, in a kind of an alpha, somewhat beta kind of stage. Um, so we launched in the fall of was that 2012, and um, by uh, the next summer, we had basically gotten to the point where we had to couldn't keep the day job anymore. Had to focus on Honey Badger, um, pretty much not not 100% full time, but quite a bit of the time because it's it's an operationally heavy business. Like we get a bunch of load coming in. If things break, like we we can't go down, right? Because people depend on us when their sites go down. So we had to do a lot of work to uh, in the early days to keep things going. Uh, you know, we, we onboard a new customer, and all of a sudden we have to deal with a bunch more traffic and that sort of that sort of thing. Um, so. So that was summer 2013. So 2014, we actually set up payroll. Uh, so that was like in January 1, we had like, hey, now we actually have a salary, right? We have a paycheck. Um, and then I guess it was probably another year. Somewhere in that year, we got to the point where we had like market salaries and we had, and then it was like January 1, 2015, we started actually buying our own health insurance as a company, which is, you know, that was like, that was awesome. Um, so yeah, somewhere, I guess around a year, year and a half is about how long it took to go from, from zero to having, feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm being paid fairly for the work that I'm doing here. And I would say, I don't know how many other founders you've talked to about that. That's a pretty quick ramp up from zero to a, a market salary. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, we, we think we did pretty well and we had three co-founders, right? So okay. all three of us, had all three paid, of us, were, which is even better yeah. because if that means yeah. all three people are getting paid, then, uh, that's definitely a, a nice ramp up. I know yeah. I even remember these days, I want to say it took me about three ish years with Sifter three, four years, um, to get to a full-time salary. So I'm definitely envious of a year and a half number. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've read, I read that generally, typically it's somewhere in that two to three year time frame that yeah. you should not expect, you know, to be living off that income. And, yeah. and I, yeah, yeah. If you beat it, great, but it's best to not count on it and to, to plan for the long run and really, you know, cut your living expenses, whatever it is to, yeah. uh, to help you extend that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about support a little bit. Um, how is support for y'all? I mean, you've got theoretically a moderately technically savvy audience. Um, and in, in some cases that can mean high expectations In other cases, it can mean really complex questions. Uh, not simply, Hey, help me reset my password, but mm -hmm. really, really complex things. How does that play out? Do you end up, uh, spending in what feels like more time and support to help troubleshoot some more complex issues? Uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting. Like you said, we have a, a customer audience who developers, they know their stuff, they know what they're doing as as well as we do many times and sometimes better. Uh and, and we get 
sometimes when we get bug reports, we also get the solutions that come with them, right? It's like, hey, I saw this problem in your site, and by the way, here's how you fix it, right? And that's that's pretty awesome. Um, we have actually awesome customers, and since we have developers as our customers, they understand what we're coming from, and so they get it. They're like, oh yeah, I know you might be having a problem with this or this other thing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, on the one hand, there's sympathy and, and empathy. Uh, on the other hand, they are very demanding, right? So developers in general like things to work. Um, I, guess, I guess it's because we're so frustrated about how many things don't work. <laughs> we get kind of demanding. And uh, I mean, I'm that way, so I understand that. Um, so when we, get, uh, when we get a problem, it's usually not, like you said, the password reset. It's usually like, hey, I sent this data in and, and it's not showing up where it should. Why is that? And that results in me going and diving in logs and looking in databases and, you know, checking, oh, oh goodness, is everything broken or, you know, are things still working, you know? Um, so yeah, a bug report can involve like a 30 minute or a three hour kind of research phase where I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But, you know, our customers are awesome. They're always understanding. And we love the opportunities to be able to like just deliver something awesome. Someone's like, hey, like uh, a few weeks ago, we had a customer who, they didn't see some data in one of our export functions that they wanted to see. And at first I was like, oh, I think you might be missing it. But then I went back and double checked and realized, oops, yeah, we're not sending that. And so I just wrote some code to send that data out, pushed out, pushed it out and deployed it like that same day. And, uh, you know, got back to that customer and said, oh, sorry, here's, here's the data you wanted. And they're like, that's so awesome. You know, uh, and that's, that's what we love doing. Yeah. That was always one of my favorite feelings is when there's something that you can turn around quickly and help somebody get their job done, whatever it is. Uh, it definitely feels like a huge win, especially in days where, you know, you've got those bad days that are, you're struggling through and then something like that comes along and it's just a, a huge, huge sigh of relief to be able to help somebody. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to go too deep, but like, so with three founders, how, uh, talk a little bit about how, uh, has that been a pretty natural division of responsibility based on, um, skill sets or is there some overlap or, I mean, I know as a solo founder, I always dreamed of the idea of having founders where I could go on vacation and not have to worry about it. Um, Mm -hmm. How has that been for y'all or do y'all each have your own area? And if one of y'all goes away and something goes wrong in that area, it's going to be a tough day. So uh, a little bit of everything. So we do have some overlap amongst us because all three of us are Ruby developers. So all three of us will get in there. We'll work on the Rails app. We'll, you know, work on backend code or whatever. Um, Star does more front end stuff. He has more talents there than I do. So I typically will leave the kind of stuff to him or to Josh. They're both pretty good at that and I'm not so much. Um, I'm the guy that's responsible for all the ops stuff. So um, as far as vacations goes, I'm probably the one that gets the least amount of vacation time. <laughs> uh, but you know, over the over the five years, we've we've automated a lot of things. And so now even I can go on vacation and not have to worry too much. Um, so we we, we tend to just like go wherever uh, we find something that interests us. So like, like stars is getting interested in the app stuff more right now. So he's like researching that and, and getting up to speed on doing more of that. Um, and, you know, we'll just, um, people ask us like, what's our process for like developing new features or whatever. And it's like, oh, whatever we find interesting, that's what we'll work on that week, you know? So it's, um, there's no like, I own this and you can't do that. Uh, yeah. And there's no like, well, I'm never going to touch that. You know, it's pretty much we're all in anywhere in the business and uh, just whatever strikes our fancy. Nice. I, I think in a lot of cases, that's probably fairly unique because most founders tend to complement each other and you don't necessarily have the benefit of that kind of overlap and coverage. So mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah. Another thing I'm very envious of there. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's been good. So you talked, you mentioned automation. Um, that's something mm-hmm. that uh, I did a little bit of in Sifter, but after going through the process of selling, I realized I didn't do far, anywhere near enough. I could have gone so much farther and done so much more, and it would have made life so much better. How have y'all uh, embraced automation? Uh, what kind of things have y'all found to be really helpful? And how has that changed kind of the day-to-day work? So early on in the business, uh, when we were dealing with a lot of scaling issues, like life was not good for me. I was not in a happy place a lot of the time because I, my hair was on fire and I was just dealing with you know stuff. And I felt like I could never get above water, my head above water. Um, and so I got some great advice from someone talking about dealing with problems on like what felt to me like a perpetual basis. Um, and he said, you know, deal with the fire right now, but then automate it. Right. So you never have to deal with that fire again. 
And uh, so I really took that to heart. And like every time I was like working on something that was broken or I had to get in there and only Ben can fix it because only he knows what's going on in there. Um, then I like documented what I did. And then I wrote code to do that for me, right? Or, or something, right? I figured out a way to, to automate that or not, just not have to deal with that problem again. Um, and then so over a period of time of doing that repeatedly, now we've gotten to a place where things are pretty smooth. Like, you know, I, I, going down to the nuts and bolts, like we have auto scaling groups that automatically spin up workers based on the queue latency, right? So, I mean, that's a really simple thing to say. It was kind of a complicated <laughs> thing to implement, you know? <laughs> um, and we didn't do that from day one. Like we purposefully set out day one, like this is a side project. We're going to just do it as we need to do it. We're not gonna like spend six months architecting the most awesome thing and then like not have any customers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that in some ways put us behind the eight ball because like the customers showed up and then we didn't have all of that scaling stuff. And so we had to like do it while we're going down the road. Um, but, you know, looking back, I think that was still a great approach, um, you know, cause us, and, you know, some anxiety and stress at times, but having gone through that, like we didn't do anything before we needed to do it. And and now we've, we've done a lot of work and it's, it's just run smoothly. It's awesome. I think probably one of the most difficult things to recognize when you're in the thick of it is when to automate and when not to, right? Because there's this mm -hmm. fear of, is this going to be premature? Am I jumping the gun, wasting time automating this when I should be doing something else? And I've got 10 other tasks I could be doing. How do I know this is the right task? Right. And so what you said, which was when there's a fire, put it out and then make sure that fire never happens again. Now, that's mm -hmm. probably not the only rule of thumb, but that seems like a good rule of thumb to kind of guide that. Because so often you finally get your head up after putting out a fire and the next thought isn't, how can I work on this some more? It's all right. What <laughs> else do I need to get to? And it's hard right. to, cause you're right. so busy looking at everything else on the horizon to stop and say, you know what, I need to go ahead and fix this so it doesn't happen again. And I think that's a really good indicator to know when it's worth fixing something and taking the time to just stay on it until it's done and then move on and not have to worry about it. So. Yeah. I think, I think you phrase that really well. It's like, it's, it's, it's not for us. It's not done once the fire is out. It's only after we get it to the point where it's not going to happen again. That's when it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on the note of fires, what's the toughest day or event that y'all have encountered with the business thus far? And it could be anything. It could be business related. It could be technical related. It could be, yeah. you name it. Yeah. Well, for me, you know, since my primary responsibility is on the ops side, you know, technical problems are my worst days. Uh, and we've had more than one. Um, but I think, I think the really the absolute worst that I can think of at the moment. Um, the one that stands out the most was early, early on, we had a, a problem with our database. We use Postgres, which we love. It's awesome. Um, but I wasn't aware of the transaction wraparound issue. And, and you may have seen, if you're into databases and stuff, you may have seen a couple of blog posts a couple of years ago about this. Um, this was before those blog posts came out. Um, <laughs> basically, this textbook, like we just, ran out basically of transactions in the database. And uh, the way Postgres works, it just shuts everything down until it cleans that up. And like nothing, there's nothing you can do, nothing that helps until that process is done. And it took hours, like hours for that database to get back to working again. And that sucked, that really, really sucked. Um, but fortunately, again, that was early on in the business. We didn't have a whole lot of customers at the time and the customers that we had were you know, they knew we were a young company and they were very understanding. So we really appreciated that. I mean, we had, of course, we had a queue. We had this huge backlog and we had to work it for hours and hours after the database came back online. Um, fortunately, we weren't, we didn't have to drop a whole lot of data. And uh, one of my favorite memories from that experience was um, like after we had finally worked through the backlog. And I guess this is probably at this point, like 12 or, or 14 hours after the initial event started, I had a customer like, write in how say how appreciative he was that we actually took the time and the effort to actually process all that data rather than drop it all. Yeah. So it was really cool. Like again, awesome customer. They understand what we're going through. Uh, that was a really horrible day for me, uh, but it, it turned out well. Yes. And I think of all the stories I've found, like the only fairly consistent factor I've found that determines whether it ends well or poorly almost always comes down to 
the company's honesty and transparency after the fact, right? Just because so mm-hmm. many companies try to kind of cover it up or talk around problems. And, you know, it, it especially with a developer audience, right? They know mm-hmm. how to write code. They know if you're full of it. And, right. I, you know, at least in my experience, it seems like the more honest and transparent they are, the better it goes for the business as a whole and the less fallout you're dealing with and all of that. And so one of the things I've always told people is like, things are going to go wrong. Once they go wrong, just be a hundred percent honest and clear about it because anything you try to cover, you know, it's always like the cover ups worse than the original. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's just something that it seems like is worth repeating for people to, to really let that sink in that, be honest and transparent and everything will be fine or as fine as it possibly can be. (laughs) Right. Um, so how, what tactics or techniques have you used to grow it? Has it mainly been word of mouth? Um, as you've grown, have there any kind of, have you hit any plateaus where you had to kind of adjust your tactics to break through? Or have you been lucky enough that growth has just been slow and steady and never really been a thought? It's just been healthy. Uh, you know, early on, um, like I said, like it was pretty easy to get growth. Uh, you just put it out on Twitter that we were launched and people were like, yes, that's awesome. We'll sign up. Uh, since then, I think the primary driver has been word of mouth. I think people love us and take us with them. Like, you know, freelancers move yeah. from project to project. Right. And so we get introduced to new people all the time that way. And, uh, developers, you know, once they get a tool that they love and they get used to, they like to stick with it. And so they take it to the next job and, and so on. So I think that's really been a great way, uh, primary for us to grow. Uh, another that we really enjoy has just been to get out and talking to people, like going to conferences and giving presentations or just hanging out at meetups. Like we love that. Um, we love working with, I mean, we are developers and so we love hanging out with the developers and and just chatting with them and, and just one-on-one kind of talking to people. And I guess, you know, it's not, we're not there to sell. Right. But it's like, Hey, we're honey badger. Here we are. And people are like, Oh, cool. Yeah. I know those guys. Um, I'll, I'll use their service. So that's, I think those two things have been the primary ways that, that we've grown the business. Um, and we've been fortunate in that we've had pretty steady, consistent growth over the life of the business. Uh, you know, of course we, we'd love to bend that curve upward and, and, and figure that out. Uh, but I don't think there's any, any magic to that. I don't think there's any, uh, shortcut. It's just a matter of, you know, continuing to plug away at the things you know you should be doing and doing them. Yeah. And I think a lot of that too, is it's easy to get carried away with desiring growth and not necessarily being fully cognizant of why you want that growth other than you're supposed to want growth. Right. Uh, and in Yael Goodman's uh, slow sass ramp of death talk, and one of the mm-hmm. things she talks about is she goes, I, I wish somebody had told me the fun was happening here and not <laughs> out here where, you know, mm-hmm. you're a more vertical growth rate. And, uh, you know, because by the time you start growing too fast, you missed all the fun and it's too late. And now your whole job is just making sure the company doesn't fall apart, you know, as it mm-hmm. goes a thousand miles an hour. Um, what are some reoccurring challenges and with automation, maybe there aren't as many that, uh, you haven't solved yet, uh, kind of what's made them difficult for you. And this is, you know, more from a SaaS perspective, like what, uh, operational things have, have y'all struggled with, uh, for whatever reason, maybe it's technical, maybe it's just not as interesting of a problem. Uh, and you know, is there anything for those problems you've tried that hasn't worked? Or think about this from the context of somebody else starting a, uh, a similar a SaaS business, uh, things that problems they're inevitably going to run into. Yeah, you know, we've, we've had uh, probably three or four inflection points, uh, I would call them, that I can identify, uh, where like on, a, on an operation side, we just, we, we hit the wall. Like we, we got to a point where what we were doing wasn't working anymore. Like it had worked just fine and now it's not working anymore. And so we had to rebuild. Um, and so we've, we've done some major overhauls of our stack uh, several times. Um, so I think like, I think you can, you can pull back from that very detailed view and say, you know, when you're running a business to me, like my philosophy is everything's an experiment. Like no one knows exactly how to do it. And if someone did like it'd be game over, right. We'd all say, Oh, we'll just do that. And then boom, it wouldn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I think like, you gotta cut yourself some slack, right? Just try something. 
right? And if it works, keep doing it. And if it doesn't work, you do something else. And at some point, what's working won't work anymore. I mean, it just won't. And uh, for whatever reason. And that's okay. Like, it's not the end of the world. You just try something else, right? Uh, the thing that's awesome about a SaaS business is that that revenue is coming in every month, right? Like with Rails kits, you know, I sold something one month and then boom, that's it. I had to start over, right? I had to get new customers coming in the door. Um, I love, you know, having the recurring revenue. And, and so you can say, okay, well, we've got a pretty good foundation. And even if we plateau, all right, well, let's let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. Let's spend some time. We've got that income coming in. We can say, hey, let's let's try something new or something different or let's tweak that. You know, and I think, um, so I guess the moral of the story is like, just try something. Like if you have an idea, try it. If it works, keep at it. And if it doesn't, try something else. And And then almost guaranteed what you're doing now at some point, we'll stop working, and so you have to do that again anyway. I, I've never thought about that, but as you're saying that, it, I'm thinking to myself, like, SaaS gives you perpetual breathing room that mm -hmm. you don't have in so many other businesses, you know, because you're afloat or inventory or whatever. With SaaS, that's not an issue. Like, you can be pretty confident it's going to work, so you've got the breathing room to experiment and be a little more out there with some of your ideas and still be fairly safe. So that's a, that's a really, really good point that I'd never, ever thought about. That's yeah, nice. All right. So if you could go back to the beginning and give yourself a heads up, what would it be? So is this something you would be ready for or something you'd say, you know what, don't even worry about that. It's not important. What would it be? What would that advice be? Well, funny aside on that, when Star and I were at, at the startup and we were like, you know, talk, talking about side projects, he had one condition and I had one condition. His condition was, I never want to be in someone's critical path. And my condition was, I don't want to have to go back to freelancing before I switch over full time to whatever we do. <laughs> and so neither of our conditions were came true, right? We're in the critical path. We had to always be up and uh, we didn't have enough money, you know, to, to support us from day one. Um, so I think if I were to go back to myself, I would kind of like get in my face and say, are you sure you really want to be in someone's critical path? Because it's kind of a big deal and you're going to have some late nights and early mornings and it's going to suck for a few years. Um, so I guess the, 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 the lesson going back in time lesson is just, just like, it may not be peaches and cream the whole time. It may suck. A lot of times um but the journey is still worth it like it's still awesome like i still love what i do i love making our customers happy i love being able to do what i want when i want and i get paid well for it i mean it's awesome i'm i'm, I'm i am living the bootstrapper's dream right yeah. uh so it's it's been painful at times i mean i've had times or you know going to bed like literally going to bed late and waking up early to deal with whatever you know blew up during the night i've had long stretches of no vacation, you know? Um, and so I, I wouldn't repeat some of those experiences if I had the choice, but overall, the whole journey has been just awesome. And I, you know, I, I love this. I love doing this. I love business. I love technology. And so I'm, I'm, I'm loving life. So, so telling yourself it's going to be a bumpy road, but the journey's worth it. Tough it out. Yeah. Maybe just do as much as possible to make the journey a little less miserable at times. <laughs> <laughs> wherever that's possible. It's easier said than done, of course. But So if you were starting a new business today, and it doesn't necessarily have to be SaaS, but uh, would it be Honey Badger or would it be something completely outside of technology? Um, you know, sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. With your well, skill you know, set, what would you do? Man, the grass is always greener, right? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's why this is a fun question. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. Gosh, you know, if I were to start something brand new today, it, it might look a lot like Honey Badger. I don't know that it would be as heavy operationally because, you know, been there, done that, don't know that I want to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one lesson that I've learned through this process that I could that I could use today would be if I could go back and change one thing, which I might, you know, if I'm starting something new today, I might do differently, is I might postpone taking the money out of the business that I did, like paying myself a salary, I might hold off on that so that I could hire someone sooner. Like we, we made a, a conscious 
decision early on in the process that we didn't really want to grow our headcount. Like we wanted to maximize revenue per employee. That was our goal. And we were very explicit about that and very upfront. And then we three of us signed on to that. And that's why we're still three of us today. Um, not that we'll never hire or we've had plenty of contractors come and go. Um, but one thing that might have made a difference and made this journey smoother would be to hire someone earlier on to take some of that load. So it wasn't just the three of us. Um, so I might do that differently. But other than that, I, I love the space I'm in. I love dealing with developers. I love technology. I love building uh, software. I love recurring revenue. I love the web, you know, uh, all, all the things I'm currently doing. I love those things. And I think I would, I would probably look for something just like that just maybe a little less uh, intensive on the operations side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, fortunately, you're past all that now, so it's all downhill from here. Or yeah. uphill, I guess, hopefully. <laughs> you know, uphill in a good way. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, really, that's all I've got. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if there's anything else you can think of that you want to share just based on your experience or words of wisdom you've heard from someone else or that, uh, you know, kind of helped you through, now would be the time to share that. Otherwise, that's all I got. So nothing. Oh, I'm good. We good. We covered it all. Oh, all right. All right. So that's it. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on. Thanks.